I'll start. Go on. Yeah. Do Hello, it. gentlemen. Hello, Hello Jamie. Hello. Hello, everybody. Welcome to <laughs> Under the Cloche. How has it all been going? Good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. Right. Really good start good. to the week. Yeah. yeah. Everyone get in safely. Why? Uh, that sounds loaded. Just because oh. I nearly didn't make it this morning. Oh. Oh. That's like a normal morning. For, for, isn't it? I'm going to phrase this correctly for possible child abuse. Sorry, you wow. said silence. Okay, you, 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 you were careful with your work. On the train. There. I've had another train incident. Now. Okay. <laughs> You're not in your best form when you commute. <laughs> no, I'm definitely not. Uh, my train line goes through Gatwick Airport. Um, family get on um, who have clearly just come back from their holidays because they're absolutely knackered and they got all their wheelies with them. <laughs> um, so it's an absolute packed train. I managed to get a seat. So I'm sat there and there's this, I don't know, maybe like a eight, nine-year-old boy who starts by sitting on the edge of the seat i'm against the window anyway as the journey goes on i start to feel him leaning up against me and i'm like okay fine and then he starts to nod off snore oh and then he goes deep sleep oh. because i feel the full weight of a human being just on me <laughs> i'm moving closer and closer to the window so it doesn't look weird but then I, I do i do a little bit of that to see if i can wake him and then him reposition but no 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 so he, he's leaning right in and I'm thinking right one of two things is going to happen here I'm going to stroke his hair <laughs> <laughs> fight all urges to stroke his hair <laughs> but it's like either he's going to slide off like my arm and into my lap or I can't have that look. No, not I, a good can't, I can't have that. I can't have that. <laughs> can't have that. <laughs> or hopefully, like the train will come to like a, a you know, a the, jolt, the, yeah. a jolt, and he'll wake up. So I'm positioning my arm like that. It gets to London Bridge where I'm about to get off, and he's not going anywhere. So I'm like, right, okay, I, I've got to get off to get the train. So I'm like, do you know what? Like as soon as I start to move, he'll wake up, reposition, I'll oh, stand no. up. Oh no! It didn't happen. Um, and uh, so I just go right. I'm just I, he's he'll wake up. Like I'll just go for it. He didn't wake up. I stood up, and he just went fud on the seat as my bum left it. Boom! Like full side of the face, <laughs> and then let out like the, the a noise that you wouldn't think. It was like a it was like a cat in distress. It was like a meow. <laughs> boom. Meow. Everyone looks at me. I'm stood there. He's like, "What the hell is going on?" No one's watched this happen. So the whole carriage is just looking at me, going, "Well, this is my stop. I'm off." It looks, and it looks this like kid you... looking like he's been slapped or something. <laughs> and then I just left the train and bolted. And then someone going, "Did you see that guy from YouTube hit that kid?" <laughs> Yeah, so that was uh, that was my journey in. The good news oh, is wow. there's CCTV on every carriage now, so that'll be on some like. Yeah, if you were, have you seen this guy? Yeah, yeah. Kind of. If you poster. work for uh, Thames Link and you find the footage, send it in. We'll, uh, <laughs> we can overlay it on the top of my storytelling. We can blur the faces. Yeah, not yours, not mine, not yours. <laughs> See it, yours. say it. <laughs> <laughs> I saw the best conspiracy theory the other day about that. Uh, it was someone on Reddit uh, said uh, was asking why have we stopped saying "sorted" at the end of when we put down uh, a recipe, and somebody put uh, they stopped doing it because uh, British Rail started doing um, "see it, say it, sorted" as their slogan, which is basically a counter-terrorism <laughs> correct <laughs> yeah. measure yeah. that they put in place. And they're like, and um, somebody from "sorted" confirmed that it was true. I was like. Who did that? Because that is the best conspiracy theory I've <laughs> wow. ever I heard. It's probably the type of thing that we said in tongue in cheek. Yeah, right? we must have Which done Which is like, oh, look at everyone getting on board with the word sorted. Yeah. We've done that. <laughs> sorted. I think we've run a fine line, though, of all the stuff we put on social, of how firmly our tongues are in our cheeks and whether people truly get the sarcasm. Sarcasm is a very British thing. It, it is. It doesn't always transfer. Hmm. And it always doesn't translate in on social. without a winky eye like yeah, a exactly face. on in text it's like when you get a message from someone and you're like i don't know whether they're joking or not they're my favorite text to yeah. send yeah of course they are. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite text, ambiguous text my favorite text to send is the emoji thumbs up because it it's so passive aggressive if anyone says anything you're just like have one of those <laughs> that's also the ultimate dad move oh no it is a proper dad move just a thumbs up speaking of Ultimate Passive, dads. aggressive, ultimate dad. <laughs> oh, I see. Oh, yeah. what a segue. But is anyone else really nervous about today's episode? I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited, equally excited as I am nervous. Because <laughs> today, today's guest is somebody that, again, we've known for a very long time. Um, we know, I'm going to put a date on it, 19 years. And I, yeah, mine's just, mm. 19 years, the day I met him as well, probably. Um, and the stories that this man tells are things that 
you can't repeat. It's one of the biggest pros and biggest cons of having him is that <laughs> whenever him. you pick up a camera, Possessive. you never know what's going to happen. But it's all great content. <laughs> yeah. He's a diamond. It's our most suggested guest so far on this podcast. This is our chat with Chef Kush. He's also just had a baby, so he's going to be very tired and very unhinged. <laughs> Hello, Kush. Hello, mate. Hi, boys. Does this feel weird? Slightly. Yeah? Yeah. Well, I, there are people over there that I can't see, but I know they're listening. I don't think we've ever had like a formal sit-down we- chat. This is casual. It's the pub. It's the bell's end. Well, we've you, got pork scratchings. You remember the, the job interview, so... Yeah, that I think formal. you called me a molester. Yeah, and I learned what colour your genitalia is. So Welcome. <laughs> you got the job. You're on board. <laughs> So what we do with everyone, we ask them about your ultimate foodgasm. So that is a place, Mm -hmm. a piece of food or a dish that you're eating. Um, Who are you with? What's the scenario? What is going to deliver that ultimate moment when it comes to food? I think for me, it's going to be in the future. Okay. It'll be next spring. Oh, (laughs) that's quite specific. Okay. (laughs) A year from now. A year from now, ish. The first occasion that I can whack the pizza oven and barbecue out and get my daughter to eat my cooking outside oh. in the sun with my wife and some wine at home. That's lovely. Oh, I like that. With no one else there. So, so what, talk specifically about the food though. The food, uh, sourdough pizza yep. cooked in my Uni Pro 16 on my patio. <laughs> some slow cooked smoked lamb shoulder style tacos in oh. the Big Weber. Cool, this is brand heavy, isn't it? <laughs> Someone's looking for a sponsorship. Yeah. <laughs> He's seen James Curry's Instagram. <laughs> I just I just need more coal and wood. Um I'd walk across to the pub that's across from my house and go get a pint for myself. Currently I'm on Rebellion Black. What's that? It looks like Guinness, but it's five point two percent. Okay, no. so, This is spoken yeah. like a true new dad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh so yeah, we've got a pub on our estate uh that is run by the community. Uh, so the pints are four pounds. There's happy hour. There's a disco. There's darts. I do big barbecues now and again. So this sounds perfect. This literally almost walk sounds across like there, bring drinks yeah. home. Could we like buy that community pub? Because that feels like the kind of thing. Could that, we just record a podcast in it? Yeah, yeah. literally you could record a <laughs> podcast. You could do a live there. It sounds like the Bell's yeah. End, but better. Yeah, well, it's Without called the, the Pavilion. The Pavilion. Oh, it's on pavilion. the cricket pitch next to the tennis courts. Wow. That's less food pun based though. So yeah. we need to work on We've that. We've got an orchard though. So if we time it right, we can go Side scrumping oh, and foraging. Yeah. And I've got a kitchen garden. Well, seeing as we're in our pub here, right. uh, I'd like to move us straight on to what you are drinking because that looks interesting. You've brought your own. I've brought my own. BYOB. Yeah, so um, it's been a long three weeks. Um, <laughs> no, it's Barocca and Red Bull mixed together. <laughs> <laughs> That is your coping mechanism. Yeah. I'm so on yeah. that. Uh, so coffee's on just not hitting the spot. No, you do need something a little bit extra mm. than coffee. Yeah, the yeah. Red Bull. I thought beer might be the answer at one point, but half an Asahi. So no. sleepy. No. Ruined. It really, yeah, it makes, yeah. You, makes you fall asleep. Right, let's get into this. Yeah. Let's get into this. Because we've got, we've got so many questions. I've got I, questions. Yeah, I don't feel like we've ever had proper answers for we've touched upon so many different things in videos and your background and where you're from and how you got to here but i i just put something out on um instagram yesterday and asked the community if they had some time with you what would they want to ask there's a lot and we of got things. so many questions and they all revolve around certain themes and i want to touch on all of them okay. in the next few minutes let's go straight in right when was the first time you laid eyes on ben ebrell what was your first interaction with him and what was your thought process at the time? Uh, first time I laid eyes on him would have been, we went to university a week before university started for a little catch up course because we were the school lot meeting the college lot for catering. So a very quiet campus and halls with I think 30 of us there. So I saw Ben uh, across the car park, I assume. He had a notebook out, you know, just <laughs> sketching out how many paces to the gate so he wouldn't be late for lectures. Um, I was setting up my speakers that were too big for my room and my big office chair because I, you know, I like loud music. Uh, so we went to Birmingham College of Food, Tourism and Creative Studies. Okay. As part of that, there was also health and beauty and uh, hairdressing 
So neither of you took advice from that part of the story. No, right. no. <laughs> but Ben being thrifty, as, are, as am I, he went to the community style uh, teaching hairdressers and had what, a... for a haircut? Yeah, for like a four, okay. like four pound haircut. Four pound haircut. Okay. And, and he still goes back, clearly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he turned up for, it might have been the first week of full lectures then, with eight different grades on one side of his head. <laughs> 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 and that, that was it, yeah. Because unintentionally or unknowingly, we essentially handed Ebers over to you at the age of 18 to look after him for a few years yes. and then give him back to us. Yeah. It was all part of the plan, yeah. We didn't expect yeah. to take him back, but, you know, no <laughs> but, returns. Well, back, I but. rode him. <laughs> I rode him for four years. You What? So we worked together on all our coursework. I okay. rode on his back. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. cool. Yeah. Makes sense. He'd yeah. start the plan, write everything down, delegate out. So, I'd look backwards from when I had to hand it in and then just try and plan it into midnight the night before <laughs> and just give him all the creative stuff and he did the due diligence and put it all together and stitch it together. Standing on the shoulders of Ebers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Perfect. He worked hours and hours and hours and smashed through his dissertation. I was at the pub by midday, some Tuesdays, um, and we both got the same result. So I take that as a win. <laughs> a net win. Yeah. Net oh, he did get a special commendation at graduation where he got to go off on stage twice. For yeah. what? Uh, being, being Ben. I think they made a whole award just for him. Well, yeah, they do have a statue of him now, don't they? They do, the yeah, 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 really yeah. small one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how did you end up at the, the university? Like, What led you to want to go into Yeah, did you food? just love food from growing up? So, Was it a massive family thing? Yeah. Like, wh wh how did you get massive into Massive family food? thing. So okay. my uh, maternal grandparents were restaurateurs, opened restaurants uh, globally. Together they opened the first sit-down a la carte Indian restaurant in India. Oh, wow. So as in like okay. a formal dining wow. space. Uh, that is still to this day in Connaught Place in Delhi. Um, so that's my mum's side. Uh, my mum's brother is a chef or was a chef. My dad's side, uh, massively into food as well. So if you got into anything else, you would have been a disappointment, essentially. I, I was very lucky in the fact that <laughs> I, I had the choice. Um, I gave myself the choice when I was like 15. When you're doing your GCSEs and A-level like kind of choices, I was like, right, aer aeronautical and mechanical engineering, because I love cars, trains and planes or become a chef. I needed math, physics, and chemistry at A-level to do one, and I needed nothing to do the other. So I said, <laughs> I'll go become a chef. Yeah. Yeah, so I used to get home from school when I was 15. Right. My mum would have uh, texted me in the daytime saying, what do you want for dinner? She'd go out, buy it, all the food, pick me up, take me home, and I'd cook myself a steak with a creamy mushroom sauce, never having cooked a steak or creamy mushroom sauce before. And thinking back, it was a frying pan with a massive ribeye in it, Jamie a whole 300 ml of cream, sliced of mushrooms and garlic. And just, it was like a, a steaky, creamy just soup. Just oil in the pan. Yeah, it was, it was delicious, but oh, no wonder I, my thighs used to rub together when I was a bit younger. Um, <laughs> so that was it. Yeah, I used to relax after school by cooking. Really? And that, then that became my hobby and it became a nerdist obsession, as my dad says. Like, I don't talk about much else other than food. So you graduate from university. Graduate from university. What's the first job that you go into after that? What was it? like was it was it a professional kitchen you so, went straight into so while at university we had a year our second year was all we were all working a placement a placement yeah. uh, ben went to ireland to work in a castle because he liked harry potter at the stage um <laughs> or hermione i don't know and i went to work in saint albans in north london kind of where we grew up yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so i literally got thrown in the deep end at a hotel that wasn't really well managed and a bit of banqueting doing weddings for 450 people um trying Which to hotel was it because i'm not, i'm staying there in uh place. stopwell house I'm oh i'm not going there but i have been there a yeah. lot yeah 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 so we used to host when i worked as a teacher we used to host the uh the sixth form graduation ball at stopwell house yeah we i wonder if you catered for my grand nana and granddad's 60th wedding anniversary actually probably so that was my university experience before that i'd done obviously burger king worked at a supermarket and a fruit and veg you know started yeah. at the start gr uh, grassroots level um graduated and then went and applied to, I think, every mission star restaurant south of Birmingham, so a bit closer to home, and re got rejected by every single one of them, saying not enough experience, not enough experience, not enough experience. But from that, from that first moment, you wanted to go in right at the sort of the top the end pinnacle. of fine dining. Like um, that's where you wanted to be. One or two mission star, yeah. Because at university, we taught, got taught the wording and how to do things, but never the practical actual application. And so if I'd started at a lower level, I'd have had a lot further to go to get to where I wanted to be yeah okay so I applied and they all just said no mm. um then my mum got involved her fellow teacher's son was the kitchen manager at Le Manoir 
okay. I'd applied there and been rejected. So she got got on hold of Rosemary, who got on hold of Andy Fuchs, who's a, a great chef, used to work with the Fat Dark, then Le Manoir. He went into the kitchen and they used it was a yes and a no pile on CVs. And he found mine in the no and said, well, he's got, you know, got good education, give him a chance. Then I got an email saying, come in for an interview. Uh, went there, stayed at a B&B, turned up for my interview in a full suit. Yeah, well played. Yeah. <laughs> uh, instantly, right, change of rooms, put your whites on, I'm like, great. Um, there was one other person interviewing as well. He turned up in uh, a t-shirt and tracky bottoms. I over-seasoned my risotto that I cooked on the second day. So, so yeah, I was gonna say, yeah. like the interview process yeah. for what, two Michelin star at the time? Two Michelin star. It was make a risotto? No, so it was or, a two day trial. Okay. So you work in the, the restaurant kitchens for two days and on the second day, uh, they say to every chef that, uh, that goes through, make a vegetarian main course in one hour. Okay. And like sorted, no wonder yeah. you're so good here. 90% of the pe uh, chefs go through that I learned having been there four years was um, they make a risotto because you flap and you panic. Yeah. So it's like, right, rice is the base, all the lovely seasonal veg uh, from all the gardens. Uh, but I seasoned my stock. So every time I added it in, I was like, oh, it's getting a bit saltier, a bit saltier. Mm -hmm. And then it got to the point where I can't finish it with Parmesan to make that lovely salty. creaminess because it's already too salty. And so I literally walked the dish up and I presented it to the executive head chef, the sous chef, they're having a meeting. And I was like, it's too salty. And they asked it, said, they, yeah, it, it is. And I was, and he said, you look really gutted and I am, can I have another go? He's like, yeah, you got half an hour. So I <gasps> legged it back, did the same thing again, seasoned it well. A few hours later, called me into the office and said, you could tell that you're distraught. Like I was, you know, this is my big chance, my one interview that I had. But because you asked to have another go, you've got the job. Brilliant. Wow. So it's mindset. Oh, and yeah, definitely. and sort but, of like your determination, and also yeah. showing the pat. I guess it's showing the passion. Yeah, it's mindset over actual physical uh, or ca capability at the time. Yeah. You can teach that. You can, but the mindset is built in from the beginning, isn't it? So, what would, what had the biggest influence on you over that time? Like, what did you learn? Were there was there a particular chef there that helped you? Um, and also, I want your biggest <laughs> cock ups as well, and <laughs> things that went wrong, and how you learned from those things. Uh, so, I was there for four years. Uh, it was two years in the kitchen and two years doing development for Raymond. In the kitchen, I learned that it's not like you see it on TV at all, in any TV show, even the really like real ones. Yeah, um, fly on the walls. Yeah, you'll go in and you'll prep eight to Savoy cabbages and then you'll have to make mashed potato, then you'll have to do this and this. And the same thing you'll do the next day and the next week and the next month. Biggest influence, there was the head chef at the time, Carl Newbury, fantastic guy, saw that I was really low at one point and sat me down and said, you're doing really well. But no one's actually said it to you, have they? Like, no. And I was like, I was nearly in tears at this point because I was just broken uh, about a year in. And he said, you're doing really well. Like you've come out of a university background with no actual real experience in you're doing this. And then literally I was at my lowest point and I started flying after that, I was really happy. Can we talk about that for a second? Yeah. What was it that was getting you down? Because I, I, I've heard, mm. I know, I know um, Slater talked about it mm. quite a bit as well when he was working in um, sort of professional kitchens mm. and things. It was like, just from a mental health aspect, there wasn't much support. Mm. You're kind of f feeling like you're on your own. Like, what was it that got you down? So it's a, it's a combination of, there's no feedback loop when you do something well in those environments. You're expected just to do it. So you uh, start at 7.30 in the morning. You have a half an hour break at 4 p.m. for your food, and then you finish at midnight, 1 a.m. And you do that five days in a row. So you're essentially broken on your days off, and you do that repetition, but you compound that with, it's 35 to 40 degrees Celsius in the kitchen. Everything's hot or cold in the freezers and the fridges, and you are being shouted at quite a bit, and it's such high paced. I have beautiful athletic calves because I stood <laughs> on my tiptoes for four years, just bouncing around, always on edge, uh, just there and obviously other restaurants, but you're always at that level. So when you turn off on your weekends, you really turn off, but then it has to go straight back up. And that just slowly wears you down and down yeah. and down. There are a couple of chefs there that really, you know, did like to put the knife in. They got sacked in the end. Um, so the really low occasion was, I was getting bullied by one chef in particular. Uh, beasted it was really hard was on the hot starter section uh, so doing all the risottos um, all the hot starters and so you were doing up to 100 covers a night which is a lot for a two mission star yeah. restaurant and on my break at four-ish I went over to the staff canteen area went upstairs rang my dad I used to speak to him every other day or so and he said what's wrong and I literally just I literally broke down yeah and f about 40 minutes later uh, he was saying you've 
got to go tell your exact chef, go tell Gary Jones, I got to say something, they'll understand. And I was like, yes, of course I will, I will. I wasn't going to, because yeah, I was just like, no, you don't hard, do that. So I hung up, wiped my eyes, turned around, and Carl, the head chef, was sitting on a sofa. And I then remembered he takes a power nap every single day on that sofa for 40 minutes. So he'd listened to the whole thing as with no filter. I mm. was telling my dad, so I'd to being totally honest. And he listened to the whole thing. Then he walked me around to uh, a bench in the little church next door, sat me down and literally said, no, you're doing really well. I'm really sorry that you feel like this, didn't know. And uh, then on, he checked on me every day and, and then all I needed was that little boost of saying, no, you're doing fantastic. Yeah, so someone, like, yeah. You're running a section a year into working at a Tumish Asai restaurant and you've had no real experience at this level before. What, um, like, you hear a lot about the culture of a professional kitchen and it's clear that you've picked up so many of, uh, so much of that mentality in that you've got an amazing sense of humour that comes in whenever like it's it's during the most peak stressy moments of even with what we're doing here mm. but also like a ruthless efficiency um in terms of that environment in a professional kitchen i know it's probably a balance between the amazing banter and that sort of uh, collective team effort yeah. but also that ruthless efficiency tell us a little bit about what it was like in your experience and the positives and negatives and, and how you think that's influenced you with what you're doing or what you did moving forward I think efficiency is the biggest thing like I love efficiency to, to a fault to the point where I can be quite blunt and terse and well, so for example and this is I, I love this <laughs> yeah but during our live shows yeah. we sometimes get some and anyone who's helping like clear kitchens or sometimes we have people in to help uh, support you in the food prep mm -hmm. for our live shows and uh, I overheard you talking to uh, a group of them once which was like I really appreciate what you're doing and what you're going to be doing but in order to make this run really quickly and efficient efficiently I'm going to say please and thank you after we're done because we need to get this out so I'm not being rude, I am being direct, but there's no time. And I'd never heard anyone almost say that before going into something, um, you know, high pressured. Yeah, so in, in a professional kitchen, the respect is there because you're all working together as a team or a brigade in the French system. And a brigade from the, the army, you're together, you're all fighting for each other. So it's implicit. You need to be direct and you say, this is your task. That's all you have to say. At the end of the day, you'll crack a beer, have a chat, ask how someone's family is, but you don't start the day with that ever. No. You don't start the day with, what did you do on the weekend? It's like, how's prep going? What okay. sauce do I need to make? You're all there. You're all a cog yep. within a machine yep. and, and the, every cog has to work perfectly. It's the focus. And I think that's so different from any other, well, any other job that I've had, which is we all have those times where you have to focus and get on with it, but mm. it's mixed in with the let's have a chat let's do you know we'll grab a coffee and talk about something else and kind of thing and then you go well actually no actually i, I do need to concentrate now but it's not hours and hours on end of pure focus no chit chat until you get to the end of that but is there, are there jokes and i keep on saying banter i hate that word but do you have any um standout funny memories or moments of your times in those those professional kitchens um we we had a piece of pak choy that you cut in half and lightly uh, braise the stem and then flop the leaves in to cook quickly. That would then be chilled. Uh, each layer would be seasoned with some homemade pickled ginger and a bit of soy and it rolled up with some sesame seeds and that was then steamed to go on a plate with some uh, organic pork, pork from the Ruger State suckling uh, pork. Uh, no pak choy was in the building that day. So I had to send one of the sous chefs out to the supermarket which is about an hour round trip to go buy pak choy. They went and bought 16 heads of pak choy and drove it back. Because it came in so late, just before service, I rushed to get it all cooked. I then overcooked every single piece of pak choy. <laughs> and um, then another chef had to drive out further because we'd bought everything from that supermarket to another one and buy it. That was a boo-boo. But then I was forced to eat every single piece. So 32 pieces of overcooked pak choy that day. <laughs> uh, it took me eight hours. I got a round of applause by the full kitchen and the uh, sushi at the time that had forced me to eat it looked really angry. <laughs> wow. <laughs> what happened? Because you started 
to work closer with Raymond Blanc, mm. who was the owner of Le Manoir. He's the chef, pr- chef proprietor. So he uh, started it as Le Manoir restaurant in North Oxford. It was like a restaurant on the bottom of a terrace block of apartments, essentially. Um, and then he bought Great Milton Manor and that became Le Manoir de Quatre Saisons. So the Manor of Four Seasons. So he's still there to this day. Uh, the restaurant's had two mission stars for I think 40 years now. I was on Hot Starters, stirring risotto, and Raymond asked Gary Jones, the executive head chef of the restaurant, I need someone uh, to come and help him and his development chef, Adam, uh, to do development, because they're doing more TV work, magazines, etc. cetera. Uh, Gary, oh, chef, weird to say Gary, <laughs> still called him chef in my head, uh, came down to the kitchen um, in the beginning of lunch service, and if he wanted to talk to you without you walking away, he'd just put his foot on your foot. <laughs> Uh, not with any pressure, but just like any like, like close. Stop like what you're doing. Yeah, no, no. Carry on what you're doing, but, but don't I'm move away. You. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think it's a, it's a power thing, but it, it, you knew what he wanted to you'd have a chat. Uh, so he's not doing that. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> so he's in your he's in your personal space, but it's quite a confined space anyway, as a kitchen. Um, and he said he's been asked someone to join him, and he said I can see that you're a bit bored stirring risotto. Would you like to go and work with him? And I was like, oh, uh, okay. And he said, but I'd, I would lose you from the kitchen. And in my head, I was like, yes. <laughs> really? So like you didn't think I want to be, I want to work my way up to sous chef here. Like even at that point, you were like, yeah, let's go do something new. Yeah, I was like, uh, oh, if I can leave working in the kitchen to go do development and work with a world-renowned chef, but still work at the Manoir and get all the perks and work at this amazing hotel and restaurant, why not? Yeah. When he said that word, I'd lose you from the kitchen. I was like, wait, so I don't have to do, in my head instantly, I was like, so no more 18 hour shifts, no more peeling asparagus and polishing copper pans at midnight. Yeah. Done. But does that mean that the dream of working at the highest level in a kitchen to become like a head chef of Le Manoir or a similar- Was never the dream. That was never the no, dream. No. People always assume that I always wanted to have my own mission star, have my own restaurant, be a world famous chef. All I wanted was to be happy. And that changed each year of how I saw myself being happy. As long as I was respected within my field by my peers, I was fine. And the fact that by I'm then I've done- you've lost yeah, that sorry, now. Yeah, sorry, it doesn't bode well for yeah, what you're we'll doing right now. We'll that later. Well, uh, world famous, yes, respected. Mm, mm. 10,000 Instagram followers. Yeah. Woo, um, no. So You've changed. Yeah, I have, yeah, yeah. Look at this, branding. Um, so I got asked to go do development. Uh, I had to do my own mini interview for that, which was a, a thing in itself. Risotto, lovely, no. <laughs> yummy. Uh, write a simple recipe for a dish that uses various seasonal ingredients and cook it. I'd specialise in doing some Moroccan food at university. So I thought, oh, I'll do a Moroccan style roasted l- rack of lamb on a spice couscous, that kind of thing. Um, it had 26 ingredients in it because herbs and spices all count. Mm. And then it got torn apart basically like well the recipe the format is slightly wrong uh simple doesn't mean 26 ingredients but i was like but it's just lamb sauce and couscous so it's simple in my head but they meant rack of lamb peas and asparagus and a light sauce yeah okay that. and then i had to cook a steak and cook an omelet those were easy because i just watched his videos online of how just he copied them and copied it yeah and then he literally saw me doing it and came and did it with me because he can't help himself <laughs> um working with him directly afforded me travel throughout uh, France and cooked throughout France with him for TV series. Got to go and do big uh, glamorous things like cooking in the windows of Harrods for the first time ever, which wow. is weird. Doing a four course meal from the lingerie department at Harrods once it had closed. Wow. Whilst wearing it? Yeah, yeah. while wearing nothing. <laughs> yeah, well, that closed in that. Um, I, having thought a, I thought a brasserie was a restaurant. But. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not having Tarragon and having to ask a security guard to run me through Harrods at, with a torch to the f- veg area and to n- nick herbs. Whilst wearing crotchless panties. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, tough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, with Raymond on my back, <laughs> whipping me. Uh, did, a lot, did a lot of TV work, BBC series, cookbooks, all of that. Uh, got to work nine to five, had weekends off. So that was great. And I did that for two years till I got a bit bored, let's be honest. Okay. Uh, why? Like why? Because I spent more time on a laptop and doing emails with PR and uh, magazines than I did actual cooking. And then I was like, right, I need to go cook again and move and get out of a tiny little village. So I moved to Bath 
Um, and there was a job available there, senior sous chef at a one mission star uh, hotel, restaurant, Bath Priory. I applied, went there, did my trial. I was honest, I was like, I've never been a sous chef. I went from commie chef, assistant development chef. He's like, it's fine. Uh, got the job. So I did three years at Bath Priory, senior sous chef. So we had a, uh, 16 chefs in the kitchen, including a few in pastry. It was one long rectangle kitchen where Le Manoir was essentially three or four kitchens spread out throughout long corridors. Uh, Bath Priory had two walk-in fridges. Le Manoir had seven. Same amount of covers though. Did 70 in the restaurant, 30 in the brasserie, 100 on the terrace for afternoon tea in summer and club sandwiches and 32 bedrooms. Oh, love a club sandwich. And did you notice, like, what is the difference between a one-star and a two-star restaurant? Like, it's subjective. Fine. So based there's on no... the Michelin inspector at the time that goes and judges it. Interesting. So there's no, like, tick list where you can go we don't need to try as hard or we don't you know we don't need to we don't need to make this as precise as we would have done in the two no because star place. in the same question what's the difference between two and three a lot of people will argue that three is the pinnacle of cooking uh le man was at two for 40 years but having eaten at three mission star restaurants throughout the uk and france and abroad le man was still the best food i've ever eaten seen or cooked and i knew the process of going into it so all the chefs that worked at le man was and the industry in the uk still don't know why it hasn't had three stars okay but it's some people say raymond was self-trained self-taught never you know went through under any other famous chefs and michelin don't like that is it mm -hmm. politics maybe so i don't think there's much of a difference in the food it can depend on the day. It can depend on your taste individually. Uh, the season. Some places do far better in summer because they've got a bountiful, uh, you know, ingredients on their doorstep. But it was a more relaxed kitchen with better management because I was in charge. <laughs> <laughs> Please and thank yous at the end of service. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I worked under Sam Moody, executive head chef there, who I'd say was a real chef chef, a fantastic cook, um, would take just simple ingredients and turned them into really simple dishes, but elevated with little touches of genius. And he'd cook day in, day out. Did uh, you learn a lot from him then? Yeah, learn a lot on the man management side of it. Yeah, I had to do the invoicing really dull bit on a Sunday because he had Sundays off. Um, I got to play around with the lunch menu every day. Uh, he did the a la carte and tasting menus and we worked together a bit on that. A uh, whole animal butchery that I'd learned at the man one we did there. So we get in whole pigs, whole lambs, half sides of Dexter cows. Dexter being the really small cow, but it's called quite big. So nope. we had to utilize the full animal. So all the cheaper cuts, like the bellies and the shoulders would go on the lunch menu, braise down the hocks and turn them into little canapes and bonbons, all the uh, finer cuts would go on the a la carte menu. So it was a lot of balancing costs as well. Whereas Le Manoir, pretty static, mm -hmm. very expensive. We knew what the food cost was because it was posted on the wall every day, uh, but you couldn't do much to really affect it. Whereas uh, creating a lunch menu that changed every week, I was like, well, we can utilize this, utilize this, utilize this, cut out all those processes um, because we don't need them. So would you say like that's, that's where you, you, there was tangible evidence for your skill set being broadened in that role? I think definitely, yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, when I turned up, there were eight lever arch ring binder files of recipes that had been inherited from another two Prince Star restaurant that uh, essentially the chef from there Michael Keynes had opened the Bath Priory and wanted its star put Sam in its uh, in as head chef and looking at the recipes from Gidley Park the two Michelin star restaurant they were involved like there was a, a laminated A4 page with the recipe for lemon juice <laughs> what's the, what was on it what's the recipe for lemon Squeeze juice lemon sieve okay refrigerate right yeah. okay wow yeah but if that wasn't written then the follow-on recipes that needed lemon juice wouldn't have worked. That was the thinking about Oh my goodness, it's processes. Le Repertoire de la Cuisine, yeah, is, isn't it? Exactly, like all over yeah. again. So we got rid, we shrunk eight lever arch filers down to like one ring binder that had the core things like the sauces that are quite like this really good recipe for that. Um, where otherwise we just got rid of them like, oh, I need to make an asparagus soup. The chef would like, I've got a recipe. No, if you can't make an asparagus soup, you really shouldn't be working here. <laughs> If you can't make it, let's check it every five minutes. And that we taught them that way. So a lot of more of my teaching came into it then, like educating the younger generation. I was still relatively young. How old were you at this point? Uh, graduated when I was 22. Four years later, I was 26. So I was 26 to 29. Wow. They got me into wine drinking there as well. There was a great wine shop called The Tasting Room in Bath. That sadly closed now. Went in there in my first week. 
just come from Waitrose, my bag of shopping, walked in and said, I've got 10 pounds on a bottle of red that I can open now and drink while I cook. Will, the owner, said, We've met him, haven't we? We've been to the tasting rooms yeah, off yeah. of your uh, recommendation. So, yeah. He yeah. pulled a bottle of wine off the shelf, seven pounds, Aussie red. So there you go. I said, oh, I can spend a bit more. He said, no, drink that. If you like it, come back, we'll go up. Three years later, I'm buying 28 pound bottles of Barolo and uh, I had a good friend. So- uh, <laughs> He but, got you, mate. Yeah, he absolutely yeah. got you. Uh, started making my own biltong while I was there. And I used to trade biltong and beer sticks for beer with the craft beer shop guy called Chris Scullion, um, independent spirit. So made friends and grew up, I think, there. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating that you've been, that you had all of this hard work, big hours, cooking mm. all the time. And yet the single thing that you wanted to do in your spare time was make biltong cook. I mean, in the intro to this, Edwards was saying that you'd finish a shift at Le Manoir um, and on your day off, he'd come round and you'd cook him a four course dinner. Yeah, so back then it was using techniques that I'd just learned and seeing what they were Wanting like. to try them out. Yeah, uh, I was cooking in my mum's kitchen back in Berkshire then, so it didn't have sous vide, didn't have any of that. So I used to, I used to sous vide though, by rolling things <laughs> in cling film. It was your guinea pig basically, yeah. I love that. <laughs> I used to do mad things, like I'd flatten out a full pork fillet and then line it with chorizo and herbs and roll it back up like a pinwheel. Then roll that in cling film. I'd set the oven at like 100 degrees Celsius, a gas oven and put a big cast iron lecrizé pan of water in there and I had a probe. So I'd get that water to the right temperature and then hold That's the how you were cv And then put the, the pork in <laughs> and then leave it for four hours. And I was buying everything from the supermarket. So it's costing quite a bit. Um, and Ben would have been gone in the morning because he had to come back for work. How did you end up on a private yacht of a billionaire during COVID? So I... <laughs> I mean, that's a question that I have. I've done my research. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, after Bath, I was big on Twitter while I was in Bath. And I had like two and a half thousand followers because I'd, I'd written on the back of Raymond. <laughs> nice. Right, he okay. used to be on Twitter. So I'd tweeted a dish of a Sunday lunch special to my boss then, Sam. He'd replied, Uttal Kocha, the mission starred Indian chef who f followed Sam and saw the reply and then saw the picture of the food and then found me and looked at my profile. He basically said, a British Indian chef, not cooking Indian food, but at this level with his training, I want to get in touch. So he DM'd me on Twitter. Come and cook Indian food. Yeah, basically <laughs> said, um, would you like to come and work at Benares? And I'd done two years in Bath by then. So I went to meet him, Mayfair, Berkeley Square, totally different ball game from yeah. Sleepy Oxford and Bath. Had an interview with him, he said, I'd like to become executive sous chef here. I was like, ooh, executive. Uh, and help uh, modernize the menu a bit. Beast of a restaurant, turntables, 300 covers, Michelin star, um, totally different cuisine. Never cooked Indian food before by, the, by then. And the clientele, completely different, I imagine, as well. Because oh. I used to work in Barclay, I used to work above Benares. I was the least paid person in Barclay He was the Square. person who puts all the stickers on the apples. Nice. Thanks. Yeah. And that you have to peel off before you, you eat it. They're uh, useless. So great job. Yeah. And so Barclay Square Mayfair is just w one of the most rich places in London. It's, you know, just around that square, you've got the Ferrari garage, the Porsche garage, the Bentley garage, the Rolls Royce garage. Yeah. Like it is just hedge funds, yeah. uh, private banking, mm. um, wealth management, and the people going into the restaurants are just moneyed up to the eyeballs okay. yeah. money up to the eyeballs and then the lunch trade was uh tourists who were coming off oxford street for mission star indian food which you can only get in the uk at, at that stage so he said come for dinner that night so rang my uh friend up who's also a chef and said do you want to go for dinner i was going to meet up with them anyway we'll go for dinner at benares rocked up uh had seven courses and by the second course which was a tandoori skewer i said i have to work it because i need to learn how they make that Wow, that's incredible. And on the skewer, it was it was a, a crown of quail, a seek kebab, a jumbo prawn, and a bit of sea bass, each in a different marinade, but each one cooked perfectly. So the sea bass had crispy skin, somehow. So it wasn't all just done on a, ske on a single skewer? It was all done on a single skewer at the same time in a tundra. What? But we know from our experience that you can't do that and cook all those things perfectly. If there's any people together. that know about Indian Michelin star. It's the two people sitting across yeah, from yeah, you yeah, right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, 
that to me sounds incredibly difficult <laughs> yes yeah so uh, essentially you're cooking four different proteins on a metal stick in a furnace where the only controls are opening a little oxygen vent at the bottom so did you i, I take it you learned how to do that i learned how to do that and i let them do that um so i basically said i need to learn how to uh, cook that i went back to bath i went to the bookshop and bought the Benares cookbook and I said, right, if this works, this Benares cookbook works, and it's not all fake, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. I made a slow-cooked Rogan Josh whole lamb shoulder following the recipes exactly, and it was sensational. Wow. Like, too perfectly spiced and perfectly seasoned, and I followed it to the letter. I was like, well, that works. The food was fantastic. It's on Bartley Square. Yes. So I gave eight months' notice, I think. Uh, wow. Because I wanted to finish the year. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. I wasn't in that much rush, because it would have meant... Uh, moving out of one lease, finding rental. It was a big thing. I'm not going to rush into it. Getting rid of all the wine bottles. That, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Selling the car. Yeah. That was, that was painful. And uh, your role, were you man You were managing specific stations or the so kitchen? Executive sous chef. So there was executive head chef, executive sous chef. Then there was a head chef and then a sous chef. So I was second in command looking after purchasing, menu development um, and cooking as well. So, so I, you actually on the pass in the kitchen during the services yeah, as well. What yeah. were you doing? So I was tasting uh, stuff going, this is crap, send it back. <laughs> uh, so the first few months was uh, dealt, uh, was spent battling the chefs who were already there set in their ways. So most, <sighs> most the average you age in the kitchen. upstart bowls average, in. Yeah, the average uh, upstart coconut rocks up. Explain. Coconut. I've never, I've never heard that phrase before. Uh, brown and hair on the outside, but white on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that before. Have you not heard that before? No, no? okay. Uh, you know, went to Catholic and Quaker school, grew up in Berkshire, no Indian friends at all, uh, no Indian university colleagues. Have never cooked Indian, Indian food. food can't speak Hindi or Punjabi. Right. Rocking up and saying, no, you can't do that. To wow. a 40 year old chef that had worked at Oberoi and Taj in India and been flown over just to do the tandoori food there. Um, <laughs> so. How did that go down? It took a while. Yeah. Then they realised oh, I'm just trying to make things a bit more efficient and health and hygiene and the really boring bits, and then banter, and then say give them an hour extra hour off at lunch. Because I'm like you don't have to do all of that. Oh, you're so generous, cook. Yeah, extra hour. Uh, <laughs> cook it better. Cook it, <laughs> cook it safer. So got to run, help run the kitchen there, and work with Atul on again development, help him manage his restaurants in India, and we had another Banaras in Madrid, which was fun because I get to go to Madrid and help Love do it. their menu there and eat tapas and drink wine. We get him to judge our food. I know. Can you believe I... what, how stupid is that? <laughs> he has to eat and pass comment on our food. I don't do it that often, <laughs> though, do I? I know, but what, like... You do it, <laughs> even if you're not doing it for video, though. You do it silently. It goes back around the yeah. corner and you're like... <laughs> no, I don't know. So I no, watch I how you make it. I'm not going to taste that. Um, <laughs> did that for two years. It was short because London's a very fast-paced city. We used to, the rotor would come out on a Friday night for the next week. I was lonely. I was oh. dating. Uh, I met Amisha, my now wife and mother of my child. And I literally thought, I can't build a relationship with this person if I don't have a routine. Mm -hmm. I can't text them on a Friday saying, you want to go on a date on Tuesday <laughs> and Wednesday? <laughs> um, yeah, so all, you've got all of that. The, the tiredness and you're battling against your actual personality mm, yes so that I mean what? dating must you're be really <laughs> <laughs> there are so many obstacles I was a lot slimmer and athletic then <laughs> I had that going for me yeah nice my wife now reminds me of quite a lot um, <laughs> this is not what I bought <laughs> no <laughs> not what I signed up to so I, I looked again for a job where I could do uh, just weekends off so I can um, get to know her and private chefing had always been something I was looking at so a uh, job uh, spec came up online on my break. I was sitting in the office. I think it was at Uttle's desk on his computer, just clicking refresh. Working hard. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was working. on my break. Yeah. Oh, okay, fine. I yeah. was on my break. Yeah, yeah. Uh, job spec popped up for private chef needed for um, a business and upper higher net worth individual. That's what they're called. That could mean, you know, various things. Yeah. To work in Mayfair, Monday to Friday, holiday allowance, decent salary, blah, 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 must be able to cook Indian food. I was hello. Like, hello. <laughs> I emailed back, went and met the sales director for the company who explained a bit more saying it's a Indian billionaire. They've just set up their private offices in the company, property developer. 
on Mayfair in Mayfair, uh, looking for someone to cook him lunch. Probably owned your building. You probably did. Yes. yes. Uh, also has a mega yacht, a seventy meter mega yacht. So you might have to go do that cooking there sometimes. That sounds awful. Uh, can you cook in if you don't like? Yeah, I've been working at Benares two years. Fine, job interview. Um, the yacht's currently in the Med. Can you get out there? And I was like, I can't at sh- short notice. What, and what on a, a dinghy? <laughs> to fly down to Nice for them to send a tender in to take me on board to do my job interview on the yacht. I was like, I can't do that this week because literally we I can't. Took him to the because the, the rotor. We yeah. took him to the pub around the corner. I know, we went to the dog and truck, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> so, didn't manage to get that interview. So two weeks later, I flew to Mumbai for four days, landed, I had to go cook breakfast and then do a, a party for him at his house. Which I then late, later found out it was his wife's 30th, 30th birthday party. Um, so did a seven course oh, menu there, did breakfast. Oh, was he the same age? He was the youngest Indian billionaire ever. He had a billion oh. at 30. And then got the job, left Benares. And then a week later I was on the yacht cooking in, I think I, we were at Ibiza. And pressure wise, how did it compare to oh, good being question. in the kitchens? So in the kitchen, it's very structured. You're, you've a large team around you that you're managing and your focus is the next three months, let's say. The day-to-day should take care of itself in the kitchen. If it's not, there's something wrong. As a private chef, the day-to-day is you turn up for work, they will eat at some stage, but you don't know when. So you have to be ready. They might not want to eat what you've already prepared for them. That's printed on the menu. So you have to be ready. They might not eat at all. But they would have read the menu, so they, will, they won't want it the next day because they'll think it's old. So you've got to start from scratch every day. This is such a different mindset. Can you imagine being in the position where you've hired a private chef because they are an expert at what they do, and they come to you and say, I've cooked you this. Can you imagine being in the position of going, no. I don't fancy it. No, no don't fancy that today, but actually. It's even worse than that, isn't it? It's like you have to be their thought process of, do you know what I fancy? A sandwich. Can I have a sandwich, please? I would, I would like that. So the rules were, I say rules, the dietary restrictions. Vegetarian, no eggs, uh, no sugar, allergic to citrus, no butternut squash, carrots, pumpkin, orange vegetables for some reason. I think so, the sweetness he didn't so like. Vegetarian, but not really with any veg, please. Yeah, no, <laughs> hate, hate mushrooms. Um, didn't like artichokes, loved olives. Uh, hyper-athletic his whole family, so had to be balanced, and didn't like the same ingredients repeated within a week, and wanted a four course meal of a different cuisine every day. At that point. Is that even possible? You're just pushing buttons to see how far you can push something, So that's right? what it ended up after four years. It started off a bit like less restrictions, and it's, it's got a bit more, as I started to tickle the boxes, like, oh no, let's have another course every day and a different cuisine. So it was right, we're gonna do, go around the world basically in a week w- within those restrictions that's why our global street food episodes are so good <laughs> well, I'm yeah. not sure they're eating capsule on though no no, <laughs> no, no. carbs no deep fried carbs no and then working on the yacht was a totally different ball game uh, so a super yacht uh, mega yacht operates as a floating seven star hotel that you own and you own everyone on board and anything you want goes at any time of the day and it's all free because it's already paid for by the charter company and stuff so they come back from Pasha at four in the morning and want a tasting menu to finish at sunrise (laughs) (laughs) so you are working so you could have gone to bed at this time and then yeah you'd you'd wake up uh, a stewardess would uh, ring your cabin and say yeah boss boss is back on in one hour they've rung ahead and they want this (gasps) it's just you uh, no, it was, uh, there was three of us on board. Oh, okay. So there'd always be a full-time head chef and a sous chef that would do all the charters and the other guests. Then I'd fly in, um, not, hopefully ahead of the boss landing and get set up. So were you you in a position that was that sits above those two? Or uh, were I'd you... sit alongside the head chef of the yacht for okay. those t- when I was on board. Because you were the personal chef. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So I've... During lockdown, I um I got obsessed with Below Deck. Yeah. We watched like every series going of Below, like yeah. Below Deck, uh, Deck Med, yeah. like all of the different uh, sailboat, like all of the different like adventure ones, like and, and like the story of Below Deck was as much about the guests and uh, kind of their extreme requests and mm. all of that kind of stuff. But it was actually more about the, the crew, crew. Yeah, the and crew. Uh, how hard work 
uh, it is to doing the standards that are expected. But then also, what happens when you get a night off? Uh, yeah. So, so how how what was that balance like? So I've seen one episode of Below Deck, and I realised uh, the boat on Below Deck is quite small, and it's quite. Uh, cheap relatively relatively I mean, relative so it was it was a hundred thousand euros a night to charter the yacht that i that my boss had dry that's without full fuel food or drink <laughs> so the guests that were going on it's a different world were of a different level and expected different things and the standards were elevated to the point of like the yacht he just helped design himself so it had a half a basketball court on the front of it this and is- it had a cinema on the back of it because his son liked movies and basketball it had a running track around the main Space deck Jam. because he was athletic. <laughs> had a gym in the prime position on the top because he was athletic. We, he took the boat to Mallorca to go get his son trained by Tony Nadal, Rafa's uncle, who t- coached him. We spent three weeks sitting off the coast just so we could attend tennis camp. So, yeah. Hang on, you got this job so that you'd have spare time for your relationship? Yes. And then When? The sp- uh, no, that's the thing. The spanner got thrown in... Uh, because it was it could have been drop of a hat like yeah. i wake up i go for a shower i come out of the shower there'd be a text saying he wants you here on monday for three weeks i was like oh and is this because you were good at your job and therefore he asked you were there was more asked of you because you were doing really well so i i because he'd flown me to india to train with his chefs there because he had chefs in india his, his houses there so i knew exactly how he liked his food and his family liked their indian food and I, I got quite good at doing vegetarian stuff from all over the world by then. And so just another chef to bring on board. And he could say, oh, I've got my chef coming with me, obviously. Yeah. But during COVID, I got a message saying, he's going to the Caribbean. He says, you should come because it'd be nice for you. Because he knew I was at my apartment in East London. <laughs> so yeah, but I left Amisha there yeah. and went to the Caribbean. You weren't even married at the time, were you? No. And you're not in a position to say no. So you've got a partner at home. Yep. You were going through things like trying to buy a house mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And flick of a switch, yep. you get a message that says, I need you in the Caribbean tomorrow. And yep. now for a lot of people, you go, I've got a message saying I need to be in the Caribbean tomorrow. This yeah. is amazing. Yeah. But I'm guessing at certain points, you were just like, I can't, I can't even think about doing that. But you're not in a position to say no? No, I, I missed uh, some big family parties uh, when I was in New York working with there. Um, this one was Amisha was like go like otherwise I was at home baking a loaf of sourdough every day and making reels <laughs> <laughs> which is still on your highlights still on my highlights yeah, yeah, they're, good. yeah. they're good recipes yeah. um, <laughs> and so she was like go like yeah like she was working from home in her office full time so I was here li- all the time I was literally <laughs> you should go I was cooking baking and exercising uh, so I went out and I got to swim off the back of the yacht holding a rope uh, because we were sitting there and he was off having lunch in St. Bart's. The captain of the yacht was like, you can all go for a swim for half an hour if you want, which was quite a change from the three years before when it was very military and relaxed a bit and just got to meet different people and see them. And they'd all been bubbled on the yacht and it was all last minute because we had to get a permit to fly out of Stansted at one in the morning, do all the COVID tests. So I had to get picked up and driven to a thing to get my COVID test and then pack a suitcase and fly out there. And it was it was surreal. And then, yes, I got a text message from Benjamin David Eberl saying, hey, Kush, uh, got time for a chat. God, that's a really good impression. <laughs> so I got home that day and I walked into the house that um, me and Amisha had bought after having to cancel our wedding twice. We just bought a house instead of moved out of London. And I said, oh, Ben wants a chat. And she's like, it's a job. I was like, all right. Uh, so I uh, went upstairs, called him, and he was like, you know, James. I was like, ah. Oh. We've had a massive argument. He stormed <laughs> out of the studio. What do and I we do? Don't, we don't think he's coming back. What do I do? <laughs> uh, he was like, you know, James. I'm like, yeah. Uh, having never, I, might, I think I might have met him once at university, yeah. but it was the year below, and he was out for a year working while we were at university. Um, I'd never watched a sorted video up until that stage, if I'm honest. Cheers, mate. Wow. Nice. Why would I need support. to? Because it was for entertainment. He, mate, he had two and a half thousand Twitter followers. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. Yeah. I, don't, I had direct access to Ben. The videos weren't just oh, about Ben. On. I didn't know that. I thought come they were. On. I thought it was like MasterChef, but Ben is just sitting there and you're feeding him. <laughs> oh, no wonder you didn't watch it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and he said, would you like to come and essentially um, help fix 
something that's failing. Um, oh. No, no, no. James uh, Curry did a great job, and he said uh, it would be you know a bit of uh, filming, recipe development, home making style of things, so I could draw on my experience with BBC and cookbooks and all of that. And I was like, okay. Spoke to me. She was like, yeah, go for it. Uh, came down here, looked around, instantly judged you all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Found out you had one fridge. <laughs> I love that that's been your biggest bugbear, is that we only had one fridge. and the, uh, No, we had two. It's just that the other one had the back cut out of yeah. it so we could put a camera yeah, in it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I was like, well, there's some changes I'd, I'd need to make. I think, the, I think the big difference is James built that job into what it became because mm. that job didn't exist. Yeah. You know, he joined, he joined us and we should probably do the same chat with him actually at some point, yeah. but he joined us when, you know, it was just about recipe development um, and it was never meant to be anything else. And it was a part-time thing and it kind of grew and grew and grew over time. And he built it into like figuring it out as you go and mm. going, well, now we need a bit of this and a bit of that. And yeah. it ended up probably being a slightly misfitting jigsaw puzzle. Mm-hmm. Um, that in a, was actually up and running in a like it was amazing yeah like for you know a number of years before he left but it's also in a world that's constantly Changing. evolving yeah and so we were like okay now it's about cookbooks now it's mm. about oh we're going to go and do this tour around the u.s mm. uh for three months are you coming uh, do you want to write some blog posts do you want to help us uh, create an app uh, and and so like all of this it was constantly changing so actually trying to no wonder he was like, I just want to go and work in the kitchen again. <laughs> I just want to know what my job is. <laughs> Trying to write down what his job role was mm. when he was leaving and, and saying to like you or to anybody else and going, right, here is the job as we see it. It was a, a really difficult process well, to I'm, go through. I'm assuming yeah. that that's why there was never a role advertised and it had to be via WhatsApp, like the back channels. Yeah, we had to go but into the black Do we market. know someone <laughs> yeah. who might be able to do this kind of thing? Because I don't know how yeah. to formalise it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I've got some questions I'd like you to answer truthfully. Um, With how it was always (laughs) truthful and I know you are. If there's anyone in this room that is truthful (laughs) constantly. So with the idea of the job or the types of things that you'd be doing Mm -hmm. to the reality, Mm -hmm. were they similar? Were they better? Were they worse? It was a vague brief (laughs) working at a company that, that did many different things. And in the last three years, we've done many different things. Many yeah. different things. Um, no, it's, it's a lovely balance of working in a very intimate, dynamic company, doing various little things with the backbone of that good food always. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think the freedom to create and make light of situations and sometimes turn around and say, this is a job. Mm. poker face <laughs> hate to do this um do you like relish those moments so when we like when the the idea for a poker face comes up course. and you've got like right we need six dishes that are going to take us in completely different uh places and we need extreme reactions different reactions yeah. bodily functions mm. and everything else mm. like how much do you enjoy those moments i i think the first poker face i did we had extreme bitter we had bitrex on it you introduced us to the world of bitrex i remember making a quite elaborate cheesecake with a clarified rhubarb jelly burnt honeycomb on the side of it and then over the years the dishes have started to go right well we want to get the reaction whatever they do so it can just be a piece of toast with citric acid on it right (laughs) yeah reaction so i've bought but it's all in the pun it's all in the pun. It's all in the pun. I, I think I've brought a bit of efficiency into that side of it. Yeah. But if, the, if the end result's the same. Fit for purpose. Fit for purpose. Yeah. yeah. What, are the, what are the moments you enjoy most? Getting home. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> most enjoyable bit of it. I really like the lives. Yeah. 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 Because it's a bit like when you used to be at school and all go away on a big class trip for a week. You know, no parents, uh, get to drink a lot, um, get to cook for a large amount of people it can be as creative and wacky and there's no bad ideas really um you go into your own world actually on it. those mm. on those live like the big weekends that we do mm. like you go into a completely different place when it comes to the organization um the 
cooking for the whole team and there's like what yeah, 20 30 schedule. people mm. food schedule plus you've got the food that's required for filming mm. that we're doing for the lives and then on top of that doing the on-camera stuff mm. plus every now and again you and i just take our tops off and stand in the background yep. of <laughs> stuff that's being filmed as well like because i think the the big weekend things that we do and it actually it comes down to the travel stuff that we do as well like there is months and months and months of planning and work that goes into making those happen but actually at the end of the day we've got three four days on site and we all have a job to do mm. and we have to get it done mm. within that moment and the way that the whole team and like the external teams that come in and help us on those projects the way that we all come together they are just my favorite things it feels like one team doing something as well as we possibly can and what i love about it is as well as we possibly can means dick around as much as we possibly can <laughs> and make it as fun for everyone watching it and joining in online as it is for us and that yeah, I, I've never experienced teamwork like that in like a, a, a work, yeah. work work setting uh, before. I, I love that so much. It's even the micro briefs uh, when you guys finally got through the woods on that Friday at the um, the wintry, frosty ice one we did. The snow way out. Snow way out. That's it. Sorry, baby brain. Um, <laughs> and it was like, right, have some hot food ready for us because we're gonna need it. Right, what kind of thing you want? Oh, I'll just put some pub sacks together. What? Pork pie tower comes to mind. <laughs> yeah. Like a pyramid of pyramid a of scotch pork eggs. Pork pie tower. Yeah. yeah. There's no other job where you can just say like, that'll work. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Yeah. The supermarkets have a hilarious time when they deliver some of those shopping baskets. It's like, you spent a thousand pounds on pub snacks and scotch eggs. For who? <laughs> oh, we're all up here. We're filming. <laughs> filming what? Not quite sure yet. Can I, can I watch? <laughs> no. Tickets are sold out. So how, how long have you been doing this? They're sorted? Sorted. It'll be three years in May. Oh, we're getting very close to the cush four-year itch. Yeah, we are, aren't we? Is that a thing? What? What do you tell it's, us? Yeah. From the sounds of it, four what? years. Four years. Move on. No, but a different place in my Please life don't. now. Thank goodness. Yeah. House. Have more babies. Never moving. Yeah. Baby. Get more settled, please. Um, more settled. What can I do? Oh, redo the patio. Plant, <laughs> plant some, plant some <laughs> things at home. Uh, put a fig, uh, put a plum tree in the ground for my baby. So mm -hmm. she's got a little uh, plum tree that'll grow with her so she can pick Same plums. Same age as her, I love that, yeah. yeah. It actually planted the day before because she came 10 days early, so nearly perfect. Um, but in order to scratch the cush itch, what do we need to be doing next in order for you to feel like fulfilled. you're learning and trying new things and developing? Mm, it's tricky. It is tricky without like making myself sound like a pompous a-hole, but... I like, I like pompous a-hole. Like learning global street foods yeah i made something yesterday that we're filming next week because i had to make it in advance because i didn't know if it was physically possible so i'd never heard of it so it was a bit of research i got to taste one totally new wow learning getting to play with new equipment and gadgets are quite fun yeah uh, i like teaching yeah so i like educating you You're guys really as well good. Really i like, good like yeah. building efficiency into things clawing time back for everyone if that makes sense yeah. i'm a feeder at the end of the day as well yeah. so a very um, good feeder did, yeah. did you ever expect to be on camera yes when you, when you okay. i was quite surprised it took so long <laughs> <laughs> and I, is, I know why yeah and this is probably more a thing like we've talked about with james before and you, you always felt like you pushed james to be on camera when he might not necessarily have originally started out yeah. wanting to do that and no, i no 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 look at the brand deals he gets on instagram as a result so <laughs> you know i'll take my five percent and so there was probably some reservations from our side of we don't want to like repeat history mm. don't want to yeah i think it was uh i remember the phone call i had with ben when i was at my house i was like would i be on camera and i phrased it as would i be on camera but i think he heard it as oh would i be on camera okay mm. and i think that intonation mistake possibly filtered down to it taking quite a while because it might have been like I know it didn't sound like you wanted to be on camera I think it might have been assumed but I was always up for it yeah, well, regardless, I've been on camera like, before mm, within like, four long weeks. time ago BBC you know prime time 8pm on BBC oh, 2 all right, flip it, yeah. so I know I know what uh, you know pack shots are and things like that you call them <laughs> sexies by the way but, yeah 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 um, so I was always up for it yeah, four weeks in, skin. I was like, we need to get this guy on a cap. Get a lens in front of him. Because four weeks this in. Be fantastic, yeah. yeah. There are a lot of community questions that came in focused on what we do now and things that have happened, particularly over the last few months. Barry and the sous chef apron. Yeah. Like the biggest question that came through on Instagram was people going, really? 
did he really deserve it? And if it was up to you, who would you have given it to? I like this. I like this. So it's a hard thing to do because um, the title sous chef, it took me personally um, a degree education working at some of the best restaurants around to get that title. Mm -hmm. And Barry's walked in, asked me for some help in developing what he's going to cook for some people on the camera and being called a sous chef. So it's a bit of a slap in the face to me, him being called a sous chef. Okay. Yep. And also, who is who is he the sous to? <laughs> is he not Ebers? A sous is a second, right? Yeah. You and Ebers. Yeah. But I, in, oh, if that's the case, then no, he shouldn't be the sous chef because I wouldn't have given him that title <laughs> personally based on that day. Okay. okay. Go the on. best single dish that day was your fried chicken. I agree with that. Thanks. I 100% agree with that. Another question that was asked was, do you have any wholesome Ebers stories or moments from university they don't have to be wholesome they could be absolutely horrible <laughs> there was a time in the isle of wight <laughs> <laughs> um, wholesome i've got a fun one where he told me off once go on uh so like i said we did all our coursework together because we were both the top of our year and i hadn't started my part of the project and this was to get our like this is our final year um we should share a wall as in we, our rooms were next to each other okay okay yeah, share a wall and he, he had to call me in and like kind of uh, chastise, uh, not belittle at all. He's never like that. Uh, but basically tell have me to grow up. Have a firm word. Have a firm word and say, I expect this work done at the right time. Why do I have to chase you for it? And full well, he knew that I, I was still very hungover. <laughs> um, so then I went off and did my work and handed it into him. Did he? And he scored it and put it into the presentation and we got an A plus, whatever. But no, he was very good at university. He brought together my, you know, mad ramblings. And I, I was very good at PowerPoint, I must say. He was like dad of the group. One of the other things the community really wanted to know was people who are looking to start out a cooking career. Like, do you have any advice for them? Because you've worked in so many different areas of the restaurant mm. and the food And world. displayed so many characteristics in order to be successful as well. Mm. If you're already 30, 35, maybe don't try. Oh, that's like, good advice. Well, like keep it as a hobby. <laughs> yeah, because it takes a lot of energy and just time. If you already have a life and let's say a family, you, it's going to be very hard to dedicate enough time to get to the level that you want to quickly, let's say. Um, if you're younger, uh, go to college and then get experience in an actual restaurant really, so what, really early theoretical on. theoretical foundation then... And cook at the same time. Yeah. So do your college lectures and things like that and your cooking, but also work because you might not like it once you see actually what it is like. I also think there's so many different ways that you could go mm. now, like with the social media kind of thing, like having that hobby and turning it into something that has a an output online. Mm. Yeah, if, if you want to become a restaurant chef because you love eating at restaurants and you like MasterChef and those kind of shows online, get straight into a kitchen and learn what it's like at the bottom and then just make a decision. Don't start, don't spend money on courses or enroll in something to then find out a year later, oh, it's not pretty. Social media and those kind of things is a, for me a bit of a gray area because it's massive and a, part, a large part of my life, like doom scrolling, but also we have a large following, but also the, a food influencer versus a chef on Instagram are very different things. Mm -hmm. So if you like the food that someone's cooking, understand where their trainings come from and see if you need to get some training as well to match that. Mm. Or if it's if you've got a knack for being in front of the lens and you want to do that, then by all means. But if you want to become a work in restaurants, experience is the first thing because it's really hard to get into a kitchen without experience. So you find someone that'll let you, let you in at the beginning. Nice. Yeah. Right. Shag, marry, kill the normals. That was a question. That was a question. Okay. I've married Jamie. Come on. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm not thinking about shagging. I'm thinking about. No, but that's who's the easy killing one. out of me and Jay. That's the easy Bags. one because he's got a, uh, a smoker and a wood vibe and a pizza oven. So, yeah, so you're I. marrying him. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm worried that you're questioning whether you're going to kill me <laughs> over Barry. That's what Wait, I'm concerned Shag about here. This Shag's, is why Shag's a one time thing. Answer. Yeah. Killing's permanent. Yeah. Yeah. I'd shag Mark and kill Barry. Great. I thought that's what you'd say. Yeah. 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 I, there's no surprises I'd in that I'd give you the time me. of your life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Well, now we've got that out of the way, you can do the ultimate question. And the ultimate question, um, what one dish should everyone cook before they die? Uh, one dish everyone must cook before they die. One dish everyone must cook. Uh, fried chicken. Why? Good it's, answer. It's delicious. Correct, by the mm-hmm. way. Kush, this has been an absolutely fascinating conversation. Yeah, unbelievable. We've mentioned once or twice the fact that you have a brand new baby. I would like to revisit this conversation in a few months' time once she starts trying real food and seeing how that starts oh, weaning to happen. Kush. Yeah, That'd weaning with great, Kush. Yeah. But in the short term, I'd like to congratulate you for staying awake for the whole conversation. Yeah, well done. <laughs> <Is that> sponsored. <laughs> Barocca Red Bull combination. Mm-hmm.